Hello, this is Mark Wildman of Wildman Athletica, and today we are going to talk about design considerations for objective-based weapons training. So we started talking about this as a series. All the things we talk about on this channel, kettlebells, heavy club swinging, mace swinging, a lot of that is meant to mimic functional patterns or real movement patterns that people have done throughout history. This is not meant to replace other types of martial arts training at all, but people have brought up some stuff in the comments about different types of martial arts. So I thought we should talk about what the objectives of this whole idea is. I kind of go through an idea when I start thinking about this is that people study martial arts and those martial arts come from a specific time and place in history. Chinese martial arts come from China, Japanese martial arts come from Japan, Indonesian martial arts come from Indonesia, historical European martial arts. They all have different design considerations and they, can, and they are all taught different ways for different reasons. We are not trying to replace any martial arts here at all. We are trying to add to the idea with some specific outcome oriented training. This has a lot to do with timing, something that I see almost never done or controlled in any martial arts school ever, and then objective-based stuff. I want to get to the most important parts first. Other martial arts have different design considerations. I tend to be working in extremely small groups, one to five people, not large classes. If they are large scale schools, this design consideration does not work the same way at all. The things that I am most interested in are absolute basic things. Long sticks, broom handle length sticks in the modern world used to be walking staffs, that type of thing, something that has existed for all of human history in every culture around the world. I am interested in clubs. We're gonna talk a lot about using cold steel bats, Brooklyn Crushers, Brooklyn Smasher length clubs, because clubs are one of the original weapons that have been used throughout history. And they are represented in absolutely every culture if you go back far enough. Hercules carried a club a big old stick that was big at one end. I'm from the Ohio Valley, and in the Ohio Valley, native tribes there carry different types of war clubs, root ball war clubs, gun stock war clubs, all these other things. People did fight with clubs. Somebody had brought up stick fighting. We are not going to talk much about stick fighting in this idea for the simple reason that stick fighting is really the safe version of training for machete fighting or short sword fighting or all these other things. We can get really technical on what each type of weapon is, but that's not what this is gonna cover. If you wanna talk about that or look at that, you know, watch Matt Easton's channel, Scala Gladiatoria, for those specific things. We're not gonna talk about that stuff so much because other people talk about it in a much better way than I do. We're gonna talk about my specific goal-oriented objective version of what I'm trying to accomplish. I stay away from stick fighting because I've seen a lot of people train with sticks and then when you put a machete in their hand, they forget absolutely everything because the level of danger has changed dramatically. The sound has changed, the feeling has changed. So when I design my training, I try to get my athletes to the mental emotional preparedness part of training as soon as possible. The design considerations for the mental emotional preparedness training are the same as they are everywhere else. General physical preparedness, activity specific preparedness, sport specific preparedness, and mental emotional preparedness being the top part of the pyramid. So we talk a lot about general physical preparedness with kettlebells, mace, and club sandbag, and then making our movements useful where we start to move towards activity specific preparedness. Sport specific preparedness would be actual martial arts training. For me, it was Aikijutsu striking Kung Fu and weapons work. That could also be modern tactical firearms training, but that all leads you to the mental emotional preparedness to actually do things. And this is something that I think gets shortcut a lot in many types of training. In stick training, I think that this gets shortcut because a lot of the stick training, uh, Kali, Arnis stuff that I've seen has specific patterns and people learn specific patterns. And then they're supposed to learn the pattern and then learn to deviate from the pattern to create the idea of flow state. Flow state is the idea that we are always talking about on this channel. I talk about this a lot with Summer Huntington and her steel mace vinyasa flow state training. Flow state is the idiosyncratic immediate response to an unknown input. 
So unknown input, somebody attacks you, your brain observes, orients, decides, and acts. OODA loops comes up with a solution and implements the solution, and we're trying to get that to be in the short microsecond area. The design considerations that we're talking about are different from other things. Somebody in the comments had pointed out MMA, that a lot of this other stuff, things like Krav Maga and stuff don't work. That is not true. MMA has a very specific design outcome. MMA is two people of equal size agreeing to fight for a specific amount of time on level ground. It is essentially dueling. Traditional martial arts are designed for different types of situations. In relation to MMA, somebody had said that Krav Maga was not good. That is not true. Krav Maga is great for getting a very specific type of outcome for a very specific group of people in a limited amount of time. The great thing about Krav Maga is that level one is 40 hours of training, 40 hours on the clock of training. Level two is I think 60 hours of training or it was at the school that I went to. And then it goes up to 100 hours of training. It's meant to be done in a specific amount of time, two hours of training a week. And they focus on the most simple things to get the most results fastest, which is learning to block and hit things hard. There's not a lot of the fine, sweet science in it from boxing or whatever, but you can take Krav Maga as a base and build it up to, towards the sweet science, introduce more boxing training and everything. But the thing that Krav Maga does is it's objective based. They want people to be able to deal with guns being pointed at them with knife attacks and other things that are simply not covered in MMA. I love MMA. I have a lot of MMA fighter friends. Awesome, fantastic, but it is dueling. If you think that MMA is going to prepare you to deal with weapons, it might. It might, but it, that's a toss up. That is an unknown outcome. That is a hoped for outcome from input into the equation. Things like traditional martial arts from different parts of the world have different outcome objectives. Things like Kung Fu, which I did Shaolin Kung Fu, comes from 800 years ago. People say that Kung Fu doesn't work. That's not true. People have forgotten why it worked in the beginning. And oftentimes a lot of the moves are solutions to problems which no longer exist. MMA is kind of the modern recreation of Shaolin, empty hand, long fist Kung Fu in my mind. That's how I think of it. Cultural considerations in all the martial arts as well. If you study a Chinese martial art, you will get Chinese influences in the way movement is done and the types of movement poetry that they like to create. Japanese is very different. Japanese martial arts tend not to move out of a specific area because of the limited amount of arable land in Japan over the course of its history. People were very interested in holding a specific amount of ground or holding their ground. So they tend not to move far out of a specific area as opposed to Chinese martial arts or at least Northern Shaolin which I did, which was all about covering area and leaving an area. Different design considerations for different things. But let's get back to this whole conversation up here. So we are not trying to replace MMA, Krav Maga, traditional martial arts of any kind. We are recreating martial arts drills based on objectives. And this is about the amount of time people have. MMA has an unknown amount of time putting into it based on what school you go to. Krav Maga has specific hour-based requirements. Things like Chinese martial arts and Japanese martial arts are meant to take 10, 20 years to master because they are complex. If we want to make something faster to learn, we have to make it simpler. So the most important thing that I want to see in martial arts drills is learning to not get hit. This is a pretty simple idea. What's the most important thing in martial arts, learning to hit the bad guy or not getting hit? I think it's not getting hit is the most important thing. You can get hit if you're huge and you're strong and you know how to get hit, then that's not a problem. For a lot of the people I train, young women, actresses, models, getting hit is not an option. A 110 pound girl getting hit by a 240 pound guy is not a great idea. So we would like to encourage people to block first as the most important thing. Somebody was on the comments and they said the blocks that you showed are ineffective. That guy has no clue what he's talking about. All martial arts and blocks start from a base principle, the most simple thing first. Take something, put it between you and whatever's coming at you. You will learn to do it better over time through experience. The goal in our blocking drills is to get people to do 10,000 blocks with every grip possible on a basic series of weapons so that when they block, their brain collects enough data that they can learn how to line their body up underneath it. Over time, 
if you have a lot more time, then you can take blocking and turn it into the micro blocking and all these other things that other martial arts are famous for. Things like fencing. You know, this block became an online block and then it became a wrist block and then it became changing the angle. All martial arts eventually turn hardcore blocking into an angle deflection. But we don't teach it that way first because that has a lot to do with everything else. So we're trying to do a natural learning style. We're trying to get people to experimentally learn to block the best way possible using a bunch of different objects. The objects being staff, club, and machete. Just thinking about grips with blocking, when you ask people to block with a baseball bat, the first thing that they're gonna try and do is do like a katana grip, and they're gonna block, and they're gonna figure out that that doesn't work very well at all. So we start moving people towards these grips, over, over, under, under, over, under, under, over, and then my favorite, the tiger grip, which works really well on clubs, which doesn't work for anything else. And then of course, left and right lead. Everything we will do will be designed for left and right lead. We want no good side at all ever because it affects the way your brain works. Blocking is our most important thing. And we are gonna start with blocking big outside attacks. No center line attacks in the beginning. Center line attacks are much harder. And if you start training center line attacks straight off the bat, people get very frustrated and they get hurt and they tend not to want to continue the training. So the goal is to learn to succeed, not to learn to fail. We then take those blocking drills with all of our weapons for both sides equally, and we turn them into striking drills. When you take a blocking drill and you turn it into a striking drill, you instantly change footwork drills. So we don't do footwork drills. We change the objective outcome of the drill and try to get that to change footwork drills. So you can turn left, you can turn right, you can move forward, you can move back, you can move around objects, you can move towards multiple objects. There are thousands of these drills that you can recreate every time just based on a small series of rules. The most important thing is that each drill has one objective. If you change more than one objective at a time, it tends to shortcut the way that people are learning. So you want people to learn in a very simple progressive way. Big outside attacks first, learn to block without moving your feet. Then start letting people move around. What you're instantly gonna see when you start letting people move around is that they tend not to walk, they tend to shuffle, and they tend to always have one foot forward, their good leg forward. So the goal is to force people out of that pattern and get them to move to walking around. This is an idea from Shaolin Kung Fu. It's different from boxing or MMA or Krav Maga, where in those things, they tend to shuffle a lot because they're worried about people who are much closer. And things like Kung Fu, you're worried about people who are further away because they are more battlefield martial arts where the guy is 20 feet away and you're not going to shuffle over there. You're going to run and jump over something to get to the target. So we want to make that part of our footwork drill. When we're doing these things and we're moving from blocking to striking drills, what this is going to force people to do is transitions of their grip, which is very, very important. And this is something that you will see people mess up immediately, moving from one grip to another grip, back and forth from side to side, and then learning to hit things. There's a lot of stuff that's going on in the brain there. So we want to change one thing at a time so the brain has time to work its way through all of the possible things that it could do so that people experimentally learn. If they learn it experimentally, they are much less likely to forget it over time. The other consideration that we will then work on is changing the height of the target. If there's a target on the ground, we call those zombie kill drills where you learn to cane kills able down on a target on the ground. We have targets on walls, usually heavy bags taped to posts or something like that, that people can really learn to swing at. We have head attack drills and that height of the target determines how people are going to move to the target and all of these other things that you see in the forms of traditional martial arts. A lot of times the movement in the forms of traditional martial arts will be recreated on accident by just following a specific series of rules about getting to a target the most efficient way possible in the least number of steps. Everything we do on this channel needs to be time controlled. So this is another problem that I have with a lot of other types of martial arts training. They do not train both hands equally. There is a problem where they want people to train their good side only, and you see this in things like Japanese swordsmanship. You only train your good side all the time. The idea being that you get twice as much training on that side, so you get twice as good. The problem with that is if you throw in a curveball into that equation anywhere, people tend to freak out. I want people to train an equal amount of time on both sides 
for two reasons. One, I want people to not get mentally cornered into a specific series of grips. And if anything happens outside of that, their brain lags and they can't figure it out in the amount of time that they have. The other thing is muscular training. We would also like all of these blocking and striking drills to be conditioning drills of some type. So if you're going one side or you're using a machete with your right hand, the way that I like to set it up is one minute of work followed by 15 to 30 seconds of break. For the next drill, you would do everything in your left hand. That way, you're working the neural pathways of both things, left and right hand. You'll have to think about it a lot more with your bad hand, and this causes people to automatically analyze what they are doing so that they can figure out what's going on on their right side. A lot of times, people will not notice when they're doing a specific type of inefficiency on their right side, and they will continue to do it and do it and do it, and they don't know what they're doing because that's the shortest path for their right side. The easiest path, their brain's trying to skip thinking about it. If you then set up a drill to force them to recreate that movement pattern on the left side, it changes quite a bit. But this allows us then to have time controlled training where we have one minute of work with 15 to 30 seconds of break, 30 seconds in the beginning because people's hands get pretty sore from shock loading pretty quickly. And then we'll move it down to 15 seconds so we can just get a couple more sets in an amount of time, but think about 30 minutes. If you have one minute of work, 30 seconds of rest, and then you flip sides and you do one minute of work and 30 seconds of rest, that's three minutes. So in 30 minutes, you would get in 10 of those, which means an equal amount of time with the right hand, equal amount of time with the left hand. And then that allows people to have equal muscular development and allows them to learn to turn better. That's the thing that I'm most interested in here is people just learning to walk to targets learn to breathe, learn to hit things, learn to put something between them and an incoming attack, all in a time-controlled, predictable manner. Everything I do has to be on a clock because of the nature of where I work in Los Angeles and Hollywood. People are going to give me one hour of time. I need to have every one hour of their time be slammed, slammed full of experimental learning information it has to be equally balanced muscularly so that one side isn't super sore and the other side's not sore at all that's something that i see with guys who do a lot of european style martial arts where they do a lot of sword work and they only use their right hand and then they end up with injuries on their right side because it's so overtrained and the other side is undertrained very similar to tennis players tennis players have just a hilarious series of misalignments, the more they train, usually the worse it gets. Uh, but the same thing is true of a lot of weapons training. It's very one-sided. People overtrain one thing and not the other thing. So we are trying very hard to not do that. Equal amounts of development on both sides, equal amounts of rotation in all directions, equal amounts of stepping patterns for everything. And we're trying to do everything experimentally. Change one thing at a time, let people acquire data, change one objective, or one other position, weapon, grip, height of target, and then let people's brain work their way through that thing. The whole thing is we're getting away from traditional martial arts where we name things. Naming things causes you to file things in your brain, and when specific attacks are coming in, your brain will try to capture, put it into a file, go through the files of named things you know, try to then come up with an outcome, and usually you get hit before that happens. That's something that I learned having done a lot of Aikijutsu. When things are unpredictable, your brain tries to predict them and that actually slows it down. So think of this as a neural load idea. We're trying to get your brain enough experience to respond in the best way possible in the least amount of time. We are not trying to replace any other martial arts MMA, Krav Maga, or traditional martial arts. This is a separate series of ideas to get people to do the most basic human attack and defense movements in the least period of time with the least amount of money.